covered as much as we're going to cover in terms of content, I'm going to go through some practice questions. On the exam, a large part of the uh, exam for standardized tests will involve looking at output like this and this. This is the norm reference stuff. This is the criterion reference stuff. I will give you another example, not this one, and I'm going to ask you questions about it. It will be your job to interpret those questions uh, and the data that they're referring to correctly and give me the best answer. So here are some examples. So I might ask something like, in what area does this student, Billy, rank the highest in his reference group? Well, you can look at a lot of different things. You could look at scaled scores, but you would be wrong to do that because as we talked about, these numbers vary a lot by different content areas. You could go by grade equivalent, but in this case, you are comparing them to multiple reference groups, not just their current grade level, right? So you shouldn't go by this one, because in this case, it doesn't matter how much kids in his grade did. It also matters what kids above him and below him in other grades did. You could go by the national stain on, but in some cases you'll find that you get the same answer, right? There's a lot of fives here, and stain nines are down here. You should go by the national percentile. And uh, you could usually go by the national percentile range, but again, this represents the range of where the true score likely is. And because, as you see, these lines are different, sometimes the range is a bit bigger, a little less reliable. And so the national percentile is the diamond. Again, it represents what they got. So where does he rank and how he did? Well, mathematics, right? That's where the diamond is the farthest to the right, has the highest national percentile rank score. Another question I will ask is, what grade is Billy most likely in? Now, the question is, how do you figure this out? Well, it has to do with the relationship between the national percentile score and the grade equivalent. As we discussed, when we talk about grade equivalents, grade equivalent scores are generated based on the median or middle score of people in your grade being equal to your current grade and month. Remember that this 7.3 means seventh year of school or seventh grade, third month of seventh grade. When the test is given to seventh graders, Right? The median score, if they're given it in the third month of seventh grade, the middle score, and they stack all the scores up from lowest to highest to take the one in the middle, that will be the grade equivalent of where they are now. That also, in most cases, corresponds very closely to the 50th percentile of the national percentile rank. Now, in some cases, these distributions are skewed, but most of the time, they're pretty symmetrical, and the 50th percentile uh, is the mean and is the median score of that particular grade. So the rule that we have is that if you score above the 50th percentile, that means this grade equivalent is higher than your current grade. So what we want to do is look at the diamonds that are closest to this 50th percentile line, and we see here 7.3, we see here 7.4, really close to the 50th percentile, you would say that this student is in the beginning of 7th grade. If you have one that's right on the 50th percentile, and you look at the corresponding grade equivalent, that will tell you exactly what the grade and month is. If you don't have that, you might have some that are on both sides. Well, in that case, you know that it's somewhere in between. So grade equivalent and percentile ranks are tied together, right? And that your grade equivalent will be higher than your current grade if you score above the 50th percentile. It will be lower than your current grade if you score below the 50th percentile. Next question. This student, Billy, saunters up to you and states that he is universally gifted in the universe of all things mathematics, universally. His parents call you and suggest that he skips two grades in mathematics. Your likely response would convey what? And so the idea here, and there, there's multiple choice options here, but the concept here is that you don't want to misinterpret grade equivalency scores. Um, again, he's in seventh grade here. His mathematics is 9.6. Parents are assuming, well, he should be in freshman, high school freshman math, right? 
The response is that because there are content differences across grades, we don't know if he's ready for that math. We'd have to do additional testing. What we do know is that he does seventh grade math above average. He does it as well as a high school freshman would. And that's all we know. Going on to the next question then, suppose that Billy, again, has a science scaled score of 671, which corresponds to a percentile rank of 55. However, he also has a social studies score of 669, slightly lower, which is equal to a percentile rank of 58, which is slightly higher. How can the lower scaled score be paired with the higher percentile rank? Well, this goes back with the idea, right, that the scaled scores vary from content area to content area and across grades. So in any, ga any grade, these values will mean different things. So 677 in reading is different than language, math, science, and social studies. This one's pretty close, but if you look at it, if you think back to the forward exam, they're way different. And so just because we're looking at scaled scores, we don't expect there to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with the national percentile rank. Which of the following statements is true regarding this student's, Billy's, national percentile range in language of 43 to 60? So here are some ideas that I'm trying to get at here. One, I want you to remember that it is a norm reference standard or score that gets rid of A as an option. B is all about it's based on how students in the world perform, and we don't know anything about that. Well, I mean, we know that it's national, um, but sometimes they do weird things with national things. But it's in this case, it is not against people in the world. The score is computed against how students in their reference group performed. Ah, that sounds pretty good, right? Because it's a norm reference score, it requires a reference group. And D is incorrect because it's, uh, it says it's computed by dividing the question's answer correctly by the total question. That is not a percentage. A percentile is not the same as a percentage, as we've discussed. If I ask you a question like, what percentage of students scored lower than or equal to Billy? Then you can give me the percentile rank, uh, or the national percentile. That is the correct answer. If I asked you how many students scored lower than Billy, you would have to say you can't tell, because some of those students scored the same. Right? In a lot of these cases, there's only 40 to 60 questions, and there's probably a good percentage of people who got the same score as you, especially if you're in the middle of the pack. If I asked how many people scored better, you could tell me that by subtracting the percentile rank or the national percentile from 100, and that would tell you what percentage of students scored better. So don't know lower than, do no lower than or equal to, do no greater than. What would happen to Billy's precious norm reference scores if his reference group changed to second grade students, assuming the test content is the same? Well, they would go up, of course because now he's being compared to a reference group that is generally lower skilled. If I ask the question that Billy scored above the 50th percentile in science, but has not demonstrated mastery of that many science subsections, <laughs> I don't like Billy. He's, you know, seems a little arrogant with this whole gifted universally stuff. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. Um, if you look at this right, you don't have a lot of science mastery. But if we look at this, we see that, well, he's scoring pretty well in science. How can that be? Well, just again because you're above average doesn't mean that the average group of people is any good. In other words, if everybody's not doing well in science and you're above average, you can still not have mastered science but be above average. Similarly, if, if these are district norms uh, where everyone is achieving really highly, you can be below average and still have mastered everything. You can be a super genius and mastered everything at a high level, but still be in the 1%, if bottom 1%, if I'm comparing you to the cream of the crop. One thing that I want to point out again is this idea of the OPI. And the OPI is like a percentage, but it's not exactly a percentage. Um, it represents the idea of if I had 100 questions on this assessment, how many would you be likely to get right? And so you think, well, that's kind of like a percentage, isn't it? 
the answer is yes and no. That value is not just calculated based on the percentage of items that you did get right, but which ones you got right. The combination of getting difficult questions right and easy questions wrong will give you a different OPI than if you got the same number of easy questions right, easy questions right and difficult questions wrong based on a variety of factors that we don't have time to go into. So it's like a percentage, but it's not. The, seven, the value of 77 in this case is not the percentage then of items that they got right. It doesn't mean they should get a C. Uh, in this case, that 77 means that they have mastered this portion of mathematics. They, they've done it well enough, and that's all it means. We can compare it to the national OPI and say whether they're above or below average, uh, and we can do some other things with it too, but that's about it. Um, so these are the types of questions I'm going to be asking. I'll also be asking some straightforward questions about the advantages of adaptive tests, the importance of norm, and, uh, norm reference and criterion reference tests, and then you will also have some of those ethical test preparation questions as well. I will be posting the answers, and if you have any questions on those, that's what we'll talk about on Wednesday. I'll be giving some feedback on that. And uh, the final standardized test, and that's really the final assessment in this class, will be due on Friday. All right, good luck.